Hello, good afternoon. Hello to everybody. Welcome to this new edition of Aula Dentate, which, as you know, we are organizing and divided in four webinars about the transformation of the dental office into an area of promotion of general health. Today, we're going to attend the third of these webinars. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being here on this session. I also would like to thank especially to all the speakers. They're all very good, except one. And they have a lot of expertise about the issues they're going to explain today. Also, I would like to thank SEPA, of course, and Dentate because of their commitment with education and prevention in oral health and also for a quite long time now in general health. Thank you to all of you. Also, thank you very much to the technical team who are organizing this extremely well and making that everything really flows perfectly. I'm the first one to speak and I am this famous worst speaker of all. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope that you can see it. We will see in, these, in this third webinar about the implementation in the dental office of some of the concepts we've seen so far so that we can assess the most relevant systemic risks. We want to present a protocol which has been developed by SEPA. I just want to show two slides from the first webinar just to, to remind you what, what we explained there. As you all know, we should not understand the dental office as a place where we only have to treat oral pathologies, but rather as a promotion, a place for the promotion of general health. Why? Because if we transform the dental office into an area of health promotion, we can also touch many systemic conditions which are important at the human being both from preventive and treatment point of view. This is called Promo Salud by SEPA. And you, here you can see different aspects. Promotion of periodontal health, peri-implant health, women's health, smoking cessation programs. Today we want to present also the options we have for the de early detection of diabetes and pre-diabetes and the promotion of cardiovascular health. Because these are two very important groups of pathologies, as you know. And this is what I want to explain with the slide. As you remember, probably the non-communicable chronic diseases affect a very, a very wide range of population. We're speaking about Spain and these numbers. You also have the, in the orange, yellow, the most important aspects like cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes and auricular fibrillation, among others. I don't know why I cannot change. Okay, great. Why are these pathologies so important for a dental office? If you want to detect the risk or the disease as such. Basically, because these are groups of diseases where many persons are not aware that they are affected by this diabetes, by the, these diseases. For example, here with, a, with an arrow you can see, and with diabetes mellitus, 4% of the diabetic persons, 1.5 million persons, are not aware of the, of the blood sugar level. As you know, diabetes is a, is a chronic disease which worsens the, the, the body along the time, and the earlier we can detect it, the better we can prevent the complications. The same is true for cardiovascular diseases, as you can see here. It is calculated that 50% of the adult population in Spain have very high cholesterol levels, and half of them are not diagnosed. High blood pressure. We have many, we have 50 million in Spain, more or less, and more than one third are not diagnosed. And auricular, fibr auricular fibrillation, which is a very important risk factor for strokes, also have an important part of the population which is not diagnosed. This means that if we act on these risk factors on these diseases and we do early detection, maybe we can help to reduce the mortality and morbidity numbers we have. This is what we saw in the last webinar in Spain and the 
deaths because of non-communicable chronic diseases. Most of them are because of ischemic cardiopathies and strokes. And these are aspects that, that we can influence in the dental office. Also, if you talk about risk factors, the same, the systolic, hypertension, smoking, high blood sugar levels are the most important risk factors in Spain. And we can act on them in a dental office with a protocol for the assessment of both the metabolic risk and the cardiovascular risk. Why can we do this in the dental office? Look, because we see many persons during our lives in our dental offices. More than 60% of the persons attended the dentist in the, in the last two years. The trend is that this is more than 75% in 2030 attending the dental office. One important thing that we have to assess here is that many patients who go to the dentist don't go to the physician because they think they're healthy and they don't know if they have a disease. They don't know if they have a chronic disease or if they do not control properly the risk factors. And this is why we can understand the dental office like a contact point for their general health. It has been discussed if we should do a screening like the one we are explaining here. It, it doesn't make too much sense to do systematic screening for systematic disease to the whole population because it's extremely costly and the cost-benefit relationship is not that good. But it's true that we, as dental professionals, we can assess and the persons who attend the dental office the, the chances of suffering, for example, diabetes mellitus. For example, people over 45 years of age. In all of them, we should do one of the tests we're going to spend afterwards every three years. This is very easy for dentists, especially for us who are periodontists, because periodontal patients and, in general, all persons who attend the dental office have to do so regularly for their checkups. So it wouldn't be any problem at all to, to assess the risk of diabetes every three years, or if this risk has been modified. If the patients are overweight or obese, of course, this is something that we should screen at all the age. As you can see, overweight and obesity affects almost half of the adult population in Spain. We are speaking about very, very high prevalence numbers. And we should check the possibility of of suffering diabetes or hidden diabetes in, in our lower dental patient. Something similar is true with the cardiovascular patients. As you can see, male persons over 40 and female persons over 50 or postmenopausic persons without, without any risk factors, it is recommended in these cases to do an assessment of the cardiovascular risk. This, this assessment of the cardiovascular risk is very easy to do and it should be repeated every five years more or less. To, but of course that should be customized to every case. Here in this circle you, you can see the steps we had to take to apply a protocol for the assessment of metabolic risk and cardiovascular risk in the dental office. As you see, here we have two important groups. The assessment of the metabolic risk with a protocol which is called diabetes diabet risk and another one which is for cardiovascular risk which is called cardio risk. These are four steps that can be taken sequentially, they can be modified depending on the features of every office or the type of patients which we see. But let's say that for didactic reasons it's better to show it like this. We would have a first preliminary step, well, of course we have to take a clinical history and we have to determine the habits of the patient. Secondly, we could assess the metabolic risk of these patients, in other words, how does the obesity or diabetes affect the organism? Third, we could assess the cardiovascular risk in, in, in a very easy way. As you can see, it says, says um, arterial pressure and radial pulse. It's very easy to take the, these records and to screen so that other specialists, other, other, other physicians, 
do the proper di diagnose. We don't diagnose anything. There also is another type of cardiovascular risk, which is cholesterol levels. Half of the population have very high cholesterol levels and they don't know it. And there's another test, which is called SCORE, which is uh, another tool to assess the cardiovascular risk. Step one, what do we have to do? Well, we do it every day. We take a clinical history where we assess all the systemic disease of the patients, the drugs they're taking, allergies, intolerances. And it's also important to check the habits of the patient, like smoking, alcohol consumption, diet, and the presence or absence of physical exercise, and for how long every week, basically. In this first appointment, after taking the clinical history and, and assessing the habits of the patient, we, we can talk to these persons and explain that in our office, apart from doing our oral, oral profession, our oral work, we also assess their cardiovascular risk. We have to explain why we do it, because this is a general risk that we have to detect in the population, an important risk, but we have to explain that this also influences our oral treatments. For example, as you know, smoking patients have a much higher risk of suffering periodontitis, exactly as diabetic patients and so on and so on. We should explain this, but we should not explain the protocol in the first appointment. It would be more advisable to do it when we have a better trust relationship, not because it's invasive or dangerous or anything, but for the patient it can be quite shocking that they explain to him in the dental office that they have to, well, take their blood pressure and assess the diabetes risk and so on. So it would be better to do it in the second appointment, but just to explain some concepts which are really easy, like um, the, t the time is very limited. A minimally trained person can do this in 10 to 15 minutes. I mean, it's not too much time, take into account how much time they spend at the dental office. And that the price is also extremely low because we don't use complicated machines or anything for that, as we'll see later. This is important, as you know, to explain it also to the patients. Regarding the metabolic risk, which would be the second step, in the second appointment, we can we can measure with a with a scale that is very easy to buy as you know we can check the body mass as index we can check the the waist circumference patient don't have to undress for that but they this will provide us with very interesting numbers for other types of measurements afterwards like if for example after seeing the obesity to see the possibility of having diabetes or pre-diabetes. How do we do this in the dental office? Look, usually we use this test, which is explained here, which is called thinned risk, because it was described in Finland for the first time. We ask several questions to the patient, their age, the body mask index, as we have measured there, the waist circumference, which we also have measured already, and some question about the physical exercise. How often do they eat fruits and vegetables? If they are taking any medication for high blood pressure, or if they have had high, high blood sugar levels during pregnancy, for example, and if they have very close relatives with diabetes type 2. Based on this, the answers are, are scored with points and for example if we have a final score of 15 or more it means that a patient has a high or very high risk of suffering diabetes here we can do several things either we can write a little report and send them to the physician to the endocrinologist where we did say we did not diagnose anything but we've discovered a chance the patient could be diabetic or pre-diabetic or we can measure and this is very easy to measure the levels of, of blood sugar this is very easy it's just to to prick the finger of the patient it's very very cheap to do this in with this machine in spain the cost is eight to nine euros per patient the test it takes less than five minutes in, in the dental office and the results are quite reliable as you know the glycated hemoglobin hemoglobin 
provide us with the with the hemoglobin and within the in the bloods and the red blood cells of the last months of the mean life of the red blood cells. So with this, we will have assessed the metabolic risk. Afterwards, we can assess the next important step, which is the cardiovascular risk, and look how easy it is. We just have to measure the blood pressure and take the pulse in the dental office. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a huge problem in the dental office to do so. And with this, we can first. We can assess if the patient has a high blood pressure and is not aware of it, or if they have an, an alteration in their, in their heart rhythm. We don't have to know what type of arrhythmia it is, but, but we can suspect that this is not normal. Also, we, we should, uh, also when we take the high blood pressure, we have to take into account the stress with, because of being in the dental office, the drugs they take, the anesthesia with vasoconstrictors and so on. How do we take the blood pressure? Here you can see it. These are very, very easy measures to be taken. Nothing special for a dental office. You just have to have this high blood pressure measuring device. It's better to do it in the arm than in the wrist. It's more precise. Yeah. It's better to adapt to, to this type of, of device and this way we take some measurements. We will see it. Here you can see it. Afterwards you, will, you can see it in a more detailed way. But if at the end we have a measurement of more than 140, 90 millimeter of mercury, we should send them to the, to the physician to, to get a second test. Maybe it's due to the stress because of the presence of the white coat or other situations, but we should check. Also, some, some devices have an alarm system which, which tells us when they detect an arrhythmia. If the alarm goes on, we can take the pulse and we see that the pulse is irregular. We can send the patient to the primary healthcare professional or a cardiologist and to take an, an ECG to see if they really have um, uh, are suffering any cardiopathy. Also, we can assess the cardiovascular risk measuring the total cholesterol level. We, as we've seen, it's an important risk factor for atherosclerotic disease. If we do so, we can carry out this test, which is called SCORE, which describes the risk of suffering a, a fatal cardiovascular accident in the next 10 years. We shouldn't use the word mortal or fatal in, in front of the patients. And the, feet, the parameters they measure are gender, age, smoking, systolic blood pressure. We are already have all this information. And the only data which is missing is the total cholesterol level. So with the same blood, where we also measure the, the hemoglobin, we can also measure cholesterol. It's also very accessible and a very cheap system. With this we go to this table. There's also a mathematic formula which you can use through through internet and it tells you the cardiovascular risk of the patient which can be very high, high or low. If you want to know this there is a system which has been this developed by the European Association of Preventive Cardiology where in all the patients they record the age, the blood pressure, cholesterol, smokers, and they tell you the risk. And the big advantage is that you can have a database of your patients. And you can also do a follow-up of your patients. Over several appointments you can see how they evolve. It also provides you with this report for the patient, which is really interesting because it's not what you are telling the patient, it's what the patient can read. It's very easy to understand. With all these things at the end, we have applied a protocol where we got some numbers. All these numbers, I mean, we, we could measure all of them or not, not all of them, but we should do something. And for example, if we have all these things which are marked here in red, the patient is really suffering a risk of suffering diabetes, cardiovascular issues, as you can see, obesity or, or risks of suffering pathologies associated with obesity. 
and with this we can write a report for the for their physician. In the last module, we will explain how we could establish a good relationship between physicians and dentists, so that this is a really good communication. So, for if we have a patient who is di diabetic or with high blood pressure, the physician will tell us that yes, they that they have they have provided a correct diagnosis, and that we should write this down also in the in the data sheet of our patients. These are all the, the measurements we can send to the patient through a PDF file, for example. And remember, we do not diagnose. We screen. We formulate a diagnostic suspicion, and, and this is what we do. This is another example. This is from a, this is from a private office. This is a leaflet that the patients get, and well, with that information they go to their to their doctor to their physician okay so with this i finish my my, my lecture and i hope that you are able to apply it we've been we've been applying it for years and the results were very good and the patients accepted much better than what we thought because we thought the patient would would say what why is this dentist doing all these tests i mean i, I go already to my physician but well, give it a thought, because it's, it gets a lot of prestige also to your dental office, and the patients trust the dentist more. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and yes, well, I finished. Thank you for listening. And now I would like to hand over the floor to the second speaker, who is Dr. Who is Dr. Jorge Serrano. We've seen how we detect the cardiovascular risk and metabolic risk in a dental office with a very easy protocol. But we also have a very, very important problem now for the whole humanity, which is this, this pandemic, pandemic due to SARS-CoV-2. As you know, dental offices have participated a lot in this issue because also in the the media it was said that maybe there's a higher risk of of getting infected in a dental office but I think Jorge Serrano is going to explain the prevention of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the dental office. Jorge is a physician, doctor in dentistry, master in periodontology in the Complutense University also professor and the master of periodontics. And apart from being a great person, he's a very good researcher. One of the person who knows most about my, microbial issues and oral cavities. So who better than him to speak about this? Okay, so you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Dan Tate for the support in organizing these webinars. Secondly, thank you, thank you, Miguel, for convincing me to participate. Also, I would like to thank David Herrera because of his very important help in this project and the technical team who helped me so that I don't screw it up too much with all these things related with technology and computers. Let's speak a little bit about the prevention of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the dental office. First of all, we will see the features of these of this virus. It's a spherical, vir uh, a spherical virus between 100 and 160 uh, nanometers of diameters, and he's of this family of coronavirus. Here we have different groups, alpha and beta, who attack m mammals. They can produce, for example, in humans, respiratory diseases, and then other mammals, gastrointestinal problems. And these other groups affect birds, basically, so they would be out of our range. This virus has a monocatenary RNA of positive polarity, and they encode certain structural proteins. Among them, the famous, the famous spike protein, which provides the virus with this very, very special appearance. We have other, all these other proteins, envelope, membrane, nucleocapsid. 
there we have also we have non structural proteins where these RNA independent polymerase RNA is important also. What is the interaction of the virus with the organism? First of all, it interacts with the renin, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. It has been seen that in order to enter into the cell, it uses as a receptor the ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it also uses the cellular protease TMPRSS2. If we see in which organs these proteins are expressed, we can also have an idea of of the different effects. For example, where are these proteins expressed? In the lungs, in the brain, the nasal cavity, in the colon, in the pancreas, in the kidneys, prostates and, tet and testes, and also, especially in the oral mucosa, and the, the salivary glands. So, the, the mouth, the oral cavity, would be a way of entrance for the infection and also a reservoir, an important reservoir to spread the virus afterwards. It also has been seen that the virus interacts with the immune system, pro uh, creating the syndrome of, of release of cytokines, which is associated to the respiratory distress syndrome of the adult, which in many cases leads to the death of the patient. It also interacts with the microvascular system and increases the coagulation and it creates also a disseminate intravascular coagulation with also mortal effects. So we see more or less the symptoms which, 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 we, which the virus is going to produce. Well, I, we don't have to repeat them because I think that all of us know right now all these different symptoms, cough, asthenia, head, headaches, dyspnea, diarrhea, anosmia, all these different features you all know. The incubation period, as you know, is between 1 and 14 days. And the maximum viral load appears after 5 to 6 days after the first symptoms. This, as you know, is the famous curve of our pandemic here in Spain, with the first wave, a second, third, and now we are starting with the fourth wave. And I, we hope that the peak is not as high as in the third, with what we are seeing in our streets lately. Fortunately, thank God, it seems that the vaccine is doing its job and the infection is reducing. But also it's important, if we want to prevent the transmission of the virus, we have to know how it is transmitted. We have different possibilities through respiratory secretions. As you know, these respiratory secretions, depending on their size, have different behaviors. For example, if they are bigger than 100 microns, they are going to have this ballistic, ballistic effect, ballistic drop. with these 1.5 meters of distance. But if they are smaller than 100 microns, they're going to behave like an aerosol. And depending on the size of the aerosol, they can, they can reach the respiratory area. For example, between 15 and 100 microns, they can, they can reach the upper respiratory tract, 5 to 15 mic microns, the tr uh, trachea and the bronchus, and the smaller ones can reach the alveoli. If you see, also, the expression of the proteins, proteins and the virus and the importance of their replication, we see that it's higher in the nasal cavity and it reduces when we go down to the trachea and the lungs. It's also very important in the area of the eye and in the oral, oral mucosa. So, we sh in order to say that this is a possible, possible way of transmission, we have to see if the virus present in the aerosols are viable this was proven in the studies, that the virus which are present in the aerosols can reach the target organ and create an infection. This infection is more plausible depending on the proximity and the time of exposure, the longer, the worse, more chances of, of, of being infected, and especially in closed areas with bad ventilation. So, if we speak about transmission, the main way of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is through aerosols. They can impact not only in the respiratory tract, also in the eyes and 
and the oral mucosa, and especially the risk of transmission increases in short distance in closed areas, bad ventilation, and if some activities are performed where we generate more aerosols like physical exercise, shouting, or singing. Another possible way of transmission is, is through direct contact. For example, it has been proven that the, that the virus is active on stainless steel two to three days, on plastic two to three days, copper four hours, and on paper 24 hours. If we do not disinfect, it has been seen that it's a possible way of transmission, but with a recommended uh, cleaning and disinfection measure, it's a very unlikely way of transmission. Another possibility is the vertical transmission from the mother to the child. But maybe more than more than vertical transmission, it would be contact with the secretions of the mother. Other ways of transmission could be, for example, through feces and, and, and urine. But we hope that this doesn't happen too much in the dental office. And also, but, but there's no evidence supporting this. Also, the sexual transmission has not been proven and other, area, other possibilities have been described, but with a very low risk. So uh, we have two possible, two main ways of transmission. Transmission through respiratory secretions and with contaminated surfaces. If we want to avoid the transmission through aerosols, what we should do is to avoid generating aerosols to reduce the amount of aerosols with the proper ventilation or different devices which which reduce the aerosols. We should use masks FFP2 or FFP3. And if we want to transmit if we want to avoid the transmission through contaminated surfaces, we should use for personal protection equipment and disinfection. Let's review because I think that almost all of us are using these protocols already. This is the protocol which is recommended by the Chamber of Dentists in Madrid. And I would like to stress some things that me, we could maybe change based on the new evidence. The first thing with, that we have to know is that in order, in order to avoid the transmission of the virus, we should avoid that the patients who are susceptible of transmitting the virus enter the dental office. In other words, patients who are sick or have been had a more or less early contact with the virus, we should avoid that they come to the dental office. And for that, we should do a, tri a triage over the phone. So we have to, should ask the patient all these questions. For example, do you have any of these symptoms? Fever, cough, diarrhea? Have you have in the last 14 days any of these symptoms? Have you been in contact with any person infected with SARS-CoV-2 or have you been, have you had contact or have you been in a meeting with a very high number of, of, of persons? Well, if they respond yes to any of these questions, if the patient has symptoms, we should send them to their physician and postpone our treatment 14 days. There's some questions which I think don't, don't do much, uh, don't make too much sense right now. Have you been in some areas of high risk? I mean, now, I mean, we have such a high transmission in all the areas that this question doesn't make any sense anymore. If they answer no to all the questions, okay, we will give them an appointment. We should schedule our appointments trying not to have too many patients at the same time in the waiting room. For example, it's better to, to give these appointments in the first part of the day to the more vulnerable patients. Which, which are these more vulnerable patients? Patients over the age of 60, cardiovascular diseases or high blood pressure, diabetes, COPD, oncologic patients, immunosuppressed or pregnant patients. We should, for example, schedule the appointments of the children for the last time of the day. And during this triage over the phone, we explain already to the patient what we're going to do when they come to the office. We will explain that we will take the temperature, that they should wear a mask, they should not come two hours before the appointment, that we are going to provide them with gel, that they, shown, that they shouldn't come with, with any persons with, together with them, so because we're not going to have too much people together at the waiting room. So the patient comes to the office, we open the door, and the first thing we do is to take the temperature to assess if they are suffering fever or more than 37.3 degrees. Is this tool really effective? Well, I would like to present an, a, a communication, rapid communication, where, 
based on their symptoms and how long it takes to develop them and the number of patients with severe uh, symptoms. Here they studied, based on all this, is what a study done for airports, how many persons we are able to detect taking on the temperature. What we can see is that out of 100 person, infected travelers who arrive at the airport, we were able to to detect for, uh, 44, more or less. So one out of two. One out of two with these non-contact temperature, uh, these, uh, these devices. One out of two we were not able to detect also. So it's not too effective, but taking into account that it's a quite cheap system. Well, at least we're screening out 50%. It's also true that the patients, when they're suffering symptoms, they tell us usually, I'm not, I don't want to go, I don't feel well, I think I have a flu. In case of doubt, I prefer not to go. So. But also in terms of marketing and the communication with the patient, it's good to show that we are, that we are taking some additional measures to to avoid the patients with the virus enter the office. After taking the temperature, we should offer gel to the patient, hydroalcoholic, uh, hydroalcoholic gel, for the, and maybe cover the shoes. Maybe this is uh, overdoing it, but we should disinfect the, the shoes with some hypochlorite solution, for example. And the patient goes to the waiting room. In the waiting room, we should try not to have more than two patients simultaneously, that the interpersonal distance is at least 1.5 met uh, meters. They shouldn't come with any persons uh, together with them. We should, should try that sh they should not touch all things around in the, waiting, in, the, in the waiting room and to have a proper ventilation. We also should tell the patient that they should try to avoid going to the restroom and that they should not brush the teeth in the restroom. We, for example, we we have an agreement with the staff in the office so that so that we know if the patient has come to the restroom. If so, the restroom is disinfected. For example, we tell the patient that when they leave the restroom, please le leave on the light. So if we see the light on, the cleaning staff knows that they have to go and disinfect the restroom. How do we carry out this environmental disinfection? We use sodium hypochlorite 0.1%. And in those surfaces where we cannot use isopropylic alcohol 70%. These are the substances which are going to use to disinfect the surfaces in the dental office. What about the reception staff? They should use a mask, FFP2, and glasses or face shield and, and gloves and if they can cover their hair also and wear a gown even the better the patient enters the waiting room and goes after the waiting room to to the operating room all surfaces have been disinfected with high hypochlorous solution or with alcoholic solution, 70 to 85 percent, and we should cover all the surfaces that we could with film. And we should change the film with every patient. Before the patient enters, the operating area should, should, be, should be ventilated, the air should be exchanged, or using any system of purification, if we cannot have carry out a proper ventilation. The dental chair has to be properly disinfected and also all the areas which we are going to touch should be covered. Ideally, we should prepare a working tray with all the instruments we will use, not to be touching drawers and furnaces, and uh, I mean furnitures and different surfaces to avoid cross-contamination. Cross If we have to touch something, we should disinfect our gloves with alcohol. If we have two gloves, we, we remove them, we disinfect the second pair, we take the instruments we, we, will, uh, we need, we disinfect, we use new gloves. This means that we will have to invest a lot of time. So the ideal thing is to have everything prepared on a tray, everything that's going to be used on that patient to avoid all this. 
Once everything is, is prepared, the patient has to, has to enter this, this, the working area and we can offer a hat and a gown to the patient. I would do this more in patients where we're going to perform surgery. For other types of treatment, maybe it's not, maybe it's not mandatory, so to say, in all the patients. Once the patient sits down, in the dental chair, we will ask them to to rinse with all, with with these for one minute for with one of these products. These were the, were the recommendation of the Chinese authors. But let's see now, based on the new evidence, what materials we could use. For example, if you start with hydrogen peroxide, this was an in vitro study where they compared the effectivity, the reduction of viral load on on surfaces. They compared povidone iodine and hydrogen peroxide. Here you can see on the right the reduction, logarithmic, uh, the log reduction value of the of the viral load. So we can see that with H2O2 it reduces, but but not too much. So for the mouth rinse, would I recommend hydrogen peroxide? Well, based on the present evidence, my answer would be no. This is a study Dr. David Herrera carried out with the help of his colleagues from the ETEP group. He did a very, a very detailed uh, review of all of the few studies we have. We have all these the different in vitro and vivo studies, reviews and editorials. And based on this review, we conclude that the most effective methods of those mentioned by the Chinese authors, the most advisable ones would be povidone iodine 0.2% or cetylpyridinium chloride 0.05% to 0.1%. Povidone uh, iodine would be re not recommended in allergic patients, so we would recommend the second, the second drug. What should we do? When we treat the patient, well, we would use a protection system, secondary or secondary surgical system, if we're going to surgery. As you know, hat, mask, FFP2, glasses or, or, or face shield, gloves, latex of nitrile, and covers of the shoes, gowns. And the surgical protection, that would be the same, but with a higher level of protection. We should not wear any watches or jewelry or compliments, and we should wash our hands at least 60 seconds. And after, after washing our hands, we should apply hydroalcoholic solution to this 60 to 85 percent. Other, other patients recommend the rule of five. We should wash our hands twice before and three times afterwards. I would prefer to wash my hands 60 seconds and afterwards apply a hydroalcoholic gel before and after. As we said before, we have to have all our instruments prepared and we should cover all the surfaces with these films that we have to re we will have to remove once we are finished with the treatment of our patient. During the treatment, we should try to avoid producing aerosols. Our treatment should be as short as possible. The shorter, the less aerosols we generate. Our rot rotary instruments should have, have uh, special devices also to reduce the aerosol between one patient and the other ones. We should avoid using ultrasounds, double suction, a normal one and a high volume suction device, and using a rubber dam. It has been shown that the rubber dam reduces 50 times the production of aerosols. We could also use a system to purify the air, like a HEPA filter. We can have different types of filter, carbon, for example, also to reduce all these different presence of these odors and substances. We should use work with four, ha four hands, because this reduces time and contamination. And after the treatment, we have to remove all, all these films we have placed on the, on the surfaces. We have to exchange the air in the office. 
and during the treatment we should use this purification system. Are, are these really effective, these systems? I would like to present this study. It's a cohort study, a retrospective study, where they compared one operating room where they used a HEPA filter in the suction, in the aspiration, and another, and another room where they did not use the HEPA filter. Where they did not use the HEPA filter, they saw that the number of professionals who were infected, where they did not use the HEPA filter, the number of professionals, of dentists who were infected, were higher than expected. And the other way around, where they had the HEPA filter, lower than expected. After the patient leaves, we have to remove all these disposable films we used. We should remove the rot rotary instruments, micromotor, lubricate them and disinfect them and put them into the autoclave. We should have a tray with disinf uh, disinfection material and bring it periodically to the sterilization area trying not to cross the office, the dental office, constantly with potentially contaminated materials. We should also disinfect our, our, our face shield and, and our glasses with, with alcohol solution and we should wash our hands, as we said, during at least 60 seconds and after let's use a gel, 70%. The patient goes out to the reception. He should not go back to the waiting room. And there, if possible, the patient should pay with any of the, uh, with some of these digital payment payment methods. The patient should remove the cover of their shoes and place it in an appropriate bin. Afterwards, also, let's see some special situations. For example, X-rays. It is preferable, it's better to take extra oral x-rays. And there we have to disinfect all the areas which the patient can contact. Regarding dentures, restorations, we have to clean it with water first to remove saliva and blood and afterwards, after, depending on the materials we have used, we should use any uh, different disinfectant. For example, if we have used alginate, we should use hypochlorite, 1%. If we used an elastomeric impression material, we can use chlorothalide or hypochlorite, 5.25, covidone iodine, or peroxysulfate. And the dentures and processes, it depends on the, on the material. If it's a resin denture, we can use uh, hypochlorite, for example, but we should not use hypochlorite on, on metal. We should use chlorothalides uh, or povidone iodine. In endo, we we have to disinfect everything that we use. If we use a microscope, we should clean it with hydrogen peroxide and different disinfection surfaces with a cotton pellet. Also, in pedontics, we should we, we shouldn't use ultrasounds and we should use a double aspiration or, or forced aspiration. And it's better to use manual instruments. What better than to use curettes in perio? In surgery, apart from the, from the usual tools we use, we should apply the new methods which have been recommended for COVID. And in ortho, for example, in orthodontics, in order to explain the treatment, it's maybe not necessary to see the patient in the office. We can do it over the phone. The disinfection of the precious materials, as, we, as we've seen, depending on the precious material, we use one disinfectant or another. But sometimes it's important also that the patient uh, comes to us to, to remove the different appliances. And if the patient have removed it, the pa we should provide the patient with gel so, they should not, so that they don't touch other surfaces and, and contaminate something. And we should use rubber dam also for our cementation of our brackets. Conclusions. The transmission in the dental office is possible, but up to now, we do not have too many reports which say that the dental office is an environment where we, where we have had many transmissions. But still, we should not relax. We should continue being strict 
with the implementation of all these protocols. If we, sus if we suspect the person has COVID or has been in contact with persons affected by it, we should implement the proper treatment, don't see them in 14 days. And if, in case of doubt, we could also carry out a, 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 a quick test, an antigen test, or even a PCR so, test to make sure that they cannot infect anybody. We should use uh, proper protocols for the disinfection of all the surfaces. And since one of the main ways of transmission of aerosol is the transmission through aerosols is to reduce the generation of aerosols, we should exchange the air properly and also eliminate the aerosols properly. Also, the use of mouthwashes, mouth rinses, can be important to reduce the viral load in these aerosols. Well, I hope this has been helpful, this review. of how we can avoid transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the dental office. Very well, Dr. Serrano, thank you very much for your participation here. It's always crystal clear. I, I love to convince you to participate in this because we can take a lot of advantages of all your knowledge and how well you explain it. I think it was a, it's a very important issue and we thank you really for being here. I hope that I, I was able to explain myself. As you know, my speech is not is usually not not a very good one. My pronunciation I, is not a very good one usually, and and also I've been very quick, very quick, because I was running out of time. I apologize if I went was too quick sometimes. No, no, no problem. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And now, this aula dentate this course. We have been talking about physicians, dentists, as always, in all these courses, because we are the most important ones, it seems also, always. But there are many, many more actors in, in all these healthcare events, like the promotion of oral and general health in the dental office. And now in this third webinar, and in the next one, in the fourth webinar, we will also listen to other very important elements which are really really important so that everything is successful and benefits the patient at the end and benefits us also so let's speak with the pharmaceutical industry and for this we have Joan Gispert he is physician he studied at the University of, of Navarra postgraduate in industry medicine design and statistics for research in healthcare also, he has a doctorate in, in preventive and health and public health care systems. He has worked in these all the areas of R and D, and now he has he's the head of also of of this development in dentate. So thank you twice, Joan. First of all, for being here and participating in this very important session, and second, for for being here in the name of dentate who is sponsoring all these sessions because of the com commitment they have with us, and especially with the training and the treatment of our patients. So I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much really for inviting me, Miguel. It's an honor for me to be here with you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to speak here, to share what we are doing and, and why we are doing it. I would like to explain a little bit why Dentate is supporting you. It's not something that we started now to do. You know all Dentate. Dentate was, was founded 40 years ago and from the first moment on, it has always supported these activities because we understood that our function is to, to support you in the promotion of oral health and also general health. I would like to, to share with you some examples and also some, let's take a look at the future, the future steps. Well, if you allow me to, 
I guess many of you have seen it. It's a, with a very short video, just two minutes, where we explain what's the, the spirit, what's the soul of Dentate. Let's see if this works. And we simulate the real situation of the mouth with an artificial mouth model, where we can simulate the natural changes. Thanks to the research we do in the Dentate Research Center, we can answer questions like, do we all have the same oral microbiota during the whole life? Are we able to predict diseases and changes in our health status? Research allows us to discover more effective active components. And what's more important, to know the best way of administration so that to have a customized solution for everybody, we have done an, a lot of work. We have developed interproximal brushes which offer solutions for every person's condition. We, have, we develop our ideas to turn them into reality, following the norms of, 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 of evidence and science. Working together with different universities, we ha can develop different solutions which improve our life and our oral health. Dentate Research Center, passion for the improvement of the oral health of the persons. I apologize because Ernesto told me that there was no sound in the video at first. But well, let's, let's see. Yes, now, now we can continue. Let's continue. Basically, in the video it was explained why in Dentate we have this DRC, Dentate Research Center. It was founded by, by, by Mr. Masdeval, the, fo the founder of the company, more than 40 years ago, with the goal that everybody has a good oral health. And he always added forever, forever. He said, why should people lose their teeth when they, when they age? It doesn't make sense. We have to work together to prevent this. In the Dentate Research Center, we have two goals, two missions, which are as important to one another. And maybe the first one is more important than the second one, even. The first one is to generate knowledge. The, op the goal of this DRC is to generate new knowledge about oral pathologies, about its origin and what we can do to avoid its progression. Not, all, not only generate knowledge, to generate knowledge doesn't make sense as such. We have to work together so that, that we can spread all this information, that it reaches everybody. As a consequence, if we're able to discover what is health, what's disease, we can also see in what situations we have pathologies or conditions which have a an, an non-covered need. And this is what, where we focus our work. How do we do this? We do it working in research, working together with other entities, with different universities, with research departments we have established in different universities. How do we spread the information? We do it in this Dentate Aulas, this is an example of an Aula Dentate, you know them, and also with direct collaboration with other scientific societies. At university levels, with which universities do we work together? With, with many, many universities. Overseas, here, Spain, Europe, South America. And we work also together with different scientific societies. We are very proud to be one of the first companies 
who are part of SEPA for many, many, many years. Just as in the European Federation of Periodontics, the first company who supported the European Feder Federation of Periodontology was also Dentate. And if something defines Dentate, it's passion. We are really passionate about this. We like what we do. And we, we try to, to convey this also. Regarding Aula Dentite, you know that this Aula Dentite, I guess most of you have been able to participate in, in some of these Aulas Dentite. We did this in, the, in different cities of Spain. We were, we did it in different parts of Spain, also internationally, but with after COVID appeared, well, we had to learn. And last year, for example, we we started to do all this online, through the internet, all these Aulas and Tate. We organized around 50 sessions last year. We treated different issues, of course, COVID last year, the relationship between COVID and oral health, relationship between periodontal disease, cardiovascular disease, microbiology, hygiene, the new classification of periodontal diseases. These are aulas or courses which are organized by Dentate or we, which are supported by Dentate and which are usually given by experts, scientists from different universities or, or clinicians of different countries. We have organized this in Spain and we're in different languages, Spanish, English, Italian. But what's important from last year is this number. When I saw this number, I was, was really surprised. Last year, we had almost 70,000 users who participated during the streaming of the Aulas Dente. But the most striking number is that we were able to, to spread this message to almost 225,000 persons or 223 views. Of course, these are very, very important high numbers, very high numbers. And I think that they that they reinforce us and they, they add more value, value and they, they make us also think about the importance of working together once again, working together between the scientific community and the industry. Another example, I'm not going to enter this because Dr. Serrano has explained it very well, is the issue of COVID. I just want to explain how we lived this, the importance of the oral health during these pandem pandemics. We organized different aulas than Tate. From the beginning, since the months of February and March, we organized our first courses. In those days where we had so many doubts, we didn't know almost anything. But we thought that we, that we needed a platform which allowed us to to convey from a very serious and scientific point of view and without any myths and and being able to differentiate between, between what's true and what's not true to to share the knowledge that that was present in those days about covid and covid and the oral and the oral cavity we organized this with dr sanz and dr herrera apart from the paper dr serrano mentioned where he he also participated very heavily, even if he didn't want to confess it, but you saw his name also among the authors. So we wanted to really to share where the scientific knowledge is. This knowledge has, has, has increased. We've seen how important the mouth is, not only as a, as a, also as a way of entrance for the virus and with possible influence. We saw the first studies between uh, about different antiseptics. We also did our some studies. We did some in vitro studies and clinical assays. We are some of them are almost being published. So we, we could bring together these two missions to generate knowledge, to spread the knowledge, and to create out studies to to check the the importance of the oral health. Even if in, in a pandemic where at first they may, maybe the, the population thought that the oral cavity didn't have anything to do. Another way of, of working together 
and this calls also in hand with the presentation of Dr. Carasol at first. We have worked together with the EFP and the International, the World Heart Federation, with all this information about the perio and cardio program for patients, cardiologists, and dentists, and also the 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 courses we organized in with in Mimo Cardio, with almost 4,000 persons participating here the, the last years. I'll, now, well, I have to confess, I'm a basketball fan. I'm a huge basketball fan. If you allow me to, here you can see these these two stars. We have Navarro, Rudy, Dugasol brothers. They are great experts, great players in a world of basketball. But when they work together, hand in hand, they achieve what we have achieved. We have been twice world champions in, in basketball. In soccer, they are behind us. We are very proud of that. But this is only possible if we work together with teamwork. How do we achieve this? With teamwork, defining a common goal, and in this case, it's very clear. The patient is in the center of everything. From here, I want to insist, I want to offer our collaboration from Dentate, we will always support you and, and give you this special push that you need for the promotion of oral and general health in, our pa in your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Joan Cisbert. He has been very, very clear, and it's also very important what he said. In, in many cases, we we don't take into account things which, like for example, the effort and and everything, all the work that is invested in in research for the benefit of of the persons and also the benefit of of the professional then dental professional in this case. So it's it's. I think it's good to know what also the industry does. Companies like Dentate, which are a real example for us, I'm not saying because this that because it's an aula Dentate, but because it's the reality. From SEPA, we have we have seen it for many years. As a matter of fact, I'm the first person who got a scholarship from Dentate for research about guided tissue regener regeneration when we still lived in black and white. But things have changed a lot. I'm very proud of all this. So. Thanks, thanks a lot, Joan. There are many different ways to, to live a profession and, and yours is, is, is amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So, we will see the last participant today, which, strange enough, is the Spanish Society of Peru of periodontics and who better than Javier Garcia who is the executive director of SEPA to be here of the foundation SEPA foundation and the Spanish Society of Periodontics and also the Ibero Pan American Federation of Periodontics I know Javier very well I know that he's one of the biggest promoters of the advancement of the Spanish Society of Periodontics in the last year I think he has provided the SEPA with a real realistic, but also future-oriented point of view. Thank you very much to, to him and, and also to all the work of the other persons involved. And thanks, thanks to that, SEPA is one of the leading societies, but I don't want to speak anymore. I want him to explain what's the role of the scientific societies in the promotion on oral and general health, as Joan said, did when he talked about the industry. Thank you very much, Miguel, for your words and for your invitation and for this great course you are directing. I think it's really a pioneer course in Spain and also internationally. And also thank you very much to Dentate for supporting us in these very new initiatives like this. Dentate is, is a very important company for SEPA. Not, it's a reference company, not only in Spain, also in the rest of the world. And for SEPA, it's a real honor to work together with a company with 40 years of experience, like Joan said before. But also their president, Mr. Masdebal, who has been working together with SEPA since almost 50 years, since 1962. With the first annual meetings of SEPA, of course, 
In those days, we didn't have the number of attendants we have right now. Well, focusing on what Miguel asked me to, to explain here, Miguel asked, could we speak about the role of the scientific societies in the promotion of oral and general health? And obviously, I had to accept this challenge. And I wanted to start with the essence. It's important to know where we come from in all organizations, and also in a scientific society, which, don't forget, it's a non-profit organization. 60 years later, well, 62 years later now, is still doing the same, with some differences. As you can see, the founders were smokers. And now it would be unthinkable to take a picture of the board, for example, and everybody is smoking a, a cigar. But well, in the middle of last century, you see these gentlemen, as you see, there's no woman here. This is also something unthinkable at present. These gentlemen came together when they finished in their dental office to, to share a coffee and to share experiences, to see how to evolve, how to, how to get new knowledge, how to exchange knowledge in an era where we didn't have internet or social media and where... Uh, a country like, like Spain were going through a quite obscure time, very dark times. Thanks to a lot of work, the societies, the societies have changed, both society as Society of Redondic, like SEPA, and the society in general, in Spain and in the world. So SEPA has evolved with something which is important. Just if you want, allow me to say so, the president in those days was this doctor, Dr. Fonseca. At his left, you can see Dr. Mariano Sanz, who is the father of Professor Mariano Sanz, who spoke in the first webinar. And here in the last row, you see a young man, and his name is Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente. He was a specialist, a promoter of wildlife. Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente, he appeared on TV. He was very important for our generation. The young, young, youngers, youngsters probably don't know who, who he is, but people over 30, 40, 50 will know perfectly who Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente was. So, even if in 1959 the founders were smokers, the goal is still the same. How to develop periodontics, which was called parodontics in those days, because it was translated directly from French, parodontie. How, how to develop periodontics from a clinical and scientific point of view? And how, how can we make it possible that the oral and periodontal health can reach the, the highest number, the, the biggest part of the population? Of course, our patients, but also the general population. And why is the essence still the same if the world has changed so much? Because the values have guided this development. If you read this from top to bottom, you can see a very nice word in Spanish. Riete, laugh, rigor, innovation, excellence. And one thing which is really important for an organization which is focused on the general interest, which is transparency and ethics. These are basically the same value as 60 years ago. And they will continue to be maintained so that the scientific society as SEPA can, can fulfill its role. And what is that role? Well, we have three axes who define this role. The first one, to inform and form, train dental professionals and also other groups, other, other groups of healthcare professionals, also the patients, but also all those citizens who are not patients yet, also people from communication, from ad administration. Second, to organize and coordinate initiatives with other actors. Here, the scientific society and the foundation like SEPA is very important also. And the third step, and this is what SEPA is starting right now, in this next decade, is going to be very important in that sense, to have an effect on, the, on a better assistance, a better treatment. 
The science is developed by, by researchers, by universities, who usually are linked to societies like, like SEPA, but the science has to reach the population. Science has to reach the professionals and has to finish improving the health and the quality of life of the population. These are the three main axes. With this, I could finish my, my presentations. But Miguel has asked me to insist a little bit more about this and to say some more words. I will try to be brief, but I don't want to forget about anything. Well, informing and training, forming at these levels, professionals, patients and population. This example is a clear example. We organized this course so that the information can reach the professionals. And Joan has explained very interesting numbers. Also, the number of attendants we have in this course is a clear example. This has some figures of SEPA on air. The huge effort we made last year for a scientific society to concentrate in three months, three months, in 80 days to be exact, 42,000 individual participations and 124,000 records. This is, this is a huge success. This is a milestone, as Joan said. But if we, if we look back, we can see the evolution of the Congress of SEPA. And we see how in the last decade, SEPA has made a lot of effort, a great effort to, to reach a higher number of professionals, so that the update of this knowledge in this annual meeting is an essential part. This graph is spectacular and is unique. This is for professionals, but also it is also important to translate these contents to the patients, to prepare. And we also did a, a lot, a, a great effort, creating a unique journal, which 10 years ago, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary, 20th number, 10th anniversary. Dr. Nuria Valcorba challenged us in those days, 10 years ago. Would we dare to to offer a journal to the patient, to the population, where we can offer information, which is accessible, but also serious. Well, you will see it here. We did it, 20 numbers, 20 issues so far, apart from other materials, education materials, and also with a, with a web page, which is going to be a reference in the next years, in this online world where we are right now. Another very important tool which SEPA has developed, thanks to one of our of the speakers today, thanks to Jorge Serrano, David Herrera and the ETEP group, the research group of the Competencia University of Madrid, which is this changeable health test. Cuida tus enceas, take care of your gums. With a screening method, with a color-coded screening system, which as it used in the medical world, we can facilitate the access and the understanding of the risk in the population. And also, this tool has helped us so that other healthcare professionals from medicine or pharmacy can understand the preventive reinforcement in relationship with the periodontal diseases they can offer. And it is providing us with great results. Also, the line of informing and training educating patients' population. We have these 20 issues of, of our journal and also the contact we have with the physicians. Now every Saturday and every Wednesday we speak for one minute about oral health in, in these programs. Buenos días de Javimar, Cadena 100 and the program Fin de Semana in the COPE. In COPE. And also we are signing now a collaboration with Cuidate Plus from Unidad Editorial and where we also will stress all these contents about oral health so that we can reach a higher number of persons and citizens. Of, and of course, we will reinforce our, our social media like Instagram. I would urge all of you to, to participate in our official Instagram channel. Here, I mean, I don't want to insist this, this is just, just that you can remind all the different, the high number of elements and, and links that we, that we have to take into account if we want to communicate with the population in a more general frame of, of health promotion. The second 
the second goal, to organize and coordinate initiatives. This is a little bit more complex. We don't have to tell only things, but also we have to have a good reputation and credibility so that others can join our mission. Others who are also linked to this common goal, which is health, and others which are really prestigious, like the Society of Cardiology, the Societies of Diabetes, or Primary Healthcare Societies, among others, as you can see in the lower part of the slide. This is the result of a lot of work, where all these scientific and medical societies, they, they've been able to see the, the scientific importance of SEPA, and also the different institutional dimensions of the different elements of SEPA in these 60 years of history. Thank you all of also, and we have to stress this, to our very, very close relationship with companies which are really committed, like Dentate, for example. And it's only fair to say so. In the present society, in the 21st century, there's no doubt about this. Independence is compatible with interdependence. If we we could also use this this basketball team metaphor, as Joan said. Let's take one more step. We are already facing the Agenda 2030. This is a tool from the from the United Nations. It, it was approved in, in the meeting of 2015, where they established certain goals which, so that we can use a common language between government, administrations, companies of, diff of different parts of the world to speak the same language and to identify our capacities to improve the societies and the world. Goal number three speaks clearly about health and well-being. So it seems that if we speak about oral health, and even transforming the dental offices in areas of promotion of oral and general health, it seems that this goal fits perfectly our purpose, what we are seeing here. And in this line from, from SEPA, we will establish a goal, we are just working on this initiative, so that in 2030, at least, on average, 75 to 80% of the Spanish population attends the dental office and pays attention to the dental health. The present um, percentages and, and also the, the data from the last 20 years tell us that in 2003, 36% of the population attended the dentist in Spain, of the Spanish population, 36%. In 2017, 2018, this average of 36% increased to 50%. We're speaking about an average here in different parts like Catalonia, Basque Country and Madrid. We are already at 60% almost. So this is one challenge. And the big role of a non-profit organization who works for the general benefit like SEPA is to work as the binding element, the catalyst of the different actors. Of course, the companies who have the financial potential, of course, the universities who have the knowledge, other societies, and also the clinical world, the dental offices, who also have to evolve and to, and to improve the quality of assistance, of, of care. So this is one of the big goals for this challenge of promotion of health. And with this we come to the third part, which is how to improve our care. Here I wanted to use this picture of our, of our master Blas Nogarol, who in the first webinar explained this pre-pathogenic period, if we want to speak about the promotion of, of health, quoting these important experts. And for here, SEPA, for SEPA it's very clear, and Dr. Miguel Carasol explained it very clear in his first intervention and his different presentation, different webinars, which is this PROMOSALUD protocol. It's a protocol which want to combine, of course, promotion of periodontal health, per implant health, 
oral health in general. Together with uh, smoking cessation programs and the early detection of diabetes, since they can affect and modify the parental diseases, as we have seen with the new evidence and the new classification of peri-implant periodontal diseases. As a matter of fact, one week ago, SEPA launched a protocol for smoking cessation together with the Spanish Committee for Smoking Cessation. And we're going to provide this to the 22,000 dental offices we have in Spain, also a protocols for the detection, not diagnosis, but detection, which helps to detect undiagnosed diabetes 2, type 2. It is calculated that we have around 5 million of persons in, in Spain with diabetes 2 who are unaware of it. And the mean time of diagnosis is five years. It is essential that we help to reduce this time and to offer the dental offices for the promotion of the health of these persons to detect this, these problems. And of course, the promotion of cardiovascular health, it has been mentioned already in this webinar. This wonderful activity we are doing at SEPA and Tate for the promotion of cardiovascular health in a dental office and of course also female health, women's health, which is also a very transversal element of this promosal, promosalut protocol. Here you see some examples. You can have all these materials on the webpage from SEPA, SEPA.es. They are there, accessible for free. And we are happy if you download them and if you use them, which is a real goal. So that in Spain, the 22,000 dental offices work together in this alliance for the oral and general health, a health which is led by, by SEPA. We are already in the, in the R&D uh, department of, of social promotion to, to get some sense of this graph or a strategic graph where always the patient is in the center of everything. Not only the patient, also persons without pathologies to insist in primary prevention and promotion of health and to interact, as you are seeing on this graph, with different professionals and different spaces also, which is really important also. Professionals are very important, but also the spaces where you professionals work are essential the dentist and the hygienist. The dental office is also uh, its own personality, its own entity. And SEPA is working with this in the next months and years, you will see new initiatives in that regard. And also something which we are really fond of, which is this new concept, which is called Distrito de Salud Bucal, oral health districts, where the dental office interacts with the pharmacy, with a primary healthcare center of, of that area and with other spaces where there are also other elements which are directly or indirectly related to the promotion of oral health in terms of primary prevention, of consumption of certain products, in terms of a healthy diet, for example, and a healthy lifestyle. Well, Miguel, that's it. I don't see the time. I don't know if I... I ful fulfilled the time, but thank you very much again, Miguel, for your trust. Thank you very much to Dentate and to all the experts who are participating in this very innovative course. Well, thank you very much to you, Javier, for explaining in such a clear way what SEPA was, is, and what is SEPA is going to be in the future, especially. I think it's very important to look to the future. I also should say that you have explained not only what a professional scientific society like SEPA is, but also that this work is done by all type of dental societies in Spain, uh, South America and the rest of the world, always thinking in benefit of our patients. And thanks of, to this work of, of all the dentists and the different dental offices, we have created this kind of global concept which has been successful, really successful, because we have got in touch with medical societies, entities like the administration, the pharmacies, 
the national administration for smoking cessation and so on and so on. Thank you very much for, for seeing these things and for keep seeing them. Well, I just have to conclude the session. I think it was a really interesting session, really. And I would invite you to participate in the last webinar, also, which is also interesting. Because there won't be any dentists as such, but we will have persons related to other healthcare professionals. And we have something in common, which is which are our patients, as we've said so many times. So we will speak about community pharmacy, primary health care, administration, to see what, what they're doing in pro of the oral health and the health of our patients. And until then, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much to Sepp and Tate. Thank you to all of you who are there with your computers and who make it possible that this turns out well. So behave and take care until next Thursday. Goodbye.